On the night of his death, Sean was wearing an identical anorak to this one, Campari made, orange and black, wet look, size 32 inches. And police are convinced that someone somewhere knows where Sean's anorak is lying now. Mainly because the killing was apparently motiveless, which means, of course, that you've got to explore every possible motive rather than a killing with a motive where you can set off in one direction. We've got no new initiative to work on at all. It was 10 minutes past 8 on the morning of Wednesday, April 18, 1979. 57-year-old Abington Northampton resident Iram Gord King was making her way to work on foot. Miss King took her usual shortcut through an alleyway in Birchfield Road East, 15 minutes from her home. Walking along the cobbled path, Miss King was stopped in her tracks by the sight of what appeared to be a person laid out on the ground, seemingly unconscious. Miss King initially thought that the person had perhaps taken ill or fainted. She hurried over and it became apparent that the unmoving figure was a young boy. Miss King called out but received no response. It soon dawned on her that the boy was dead. As her son was a police officer, Miss King knew not to touch the body or to interfere with the scene. She ran to find someone to call the police. Once she knew that the emergency services had been called, she returned to the boy's body to ensure that the scene was secure until the police arrived. Unbeknownst to Miss King at this time, she had just stumbled upon the body of 15-year-old Sean McGann and that her discovery would spark the beginning of a 42-year-old mystery that endures to this day. This is the story of the unsolved case of Sean McGann. Little is known about Sean McGann's short life. His family have exercised their deserved right to keep their grief and their search for justice in their son's case private. There's actually only one publicly available photo of Sean, the one that features in the thumbnail of this video. What we do know is that Sean had two siblings and was raised in an Irish Catholic family. His parents owned and ran a small family business in Northampton which specialised in car detailing products. Sean was a student at Thomas Beckett Upper School and is said to have loved horses and horse riding. He is described by family as quiet, gentle and polite. Sean's grandparents would be the last people in his life to see him alive. It was Easter and the fair was in town. Sean McGann was at his grandparents' house in Victoria Gardens. The fair was being held on Midsummer Recreation Ground, a less than 10 minute walk from their home. Drawn by the excitement of the lights, the music and the noise, Sean asked his grandparents if he could have some money so that he could go along and check out the fair. He promised to be back at his parents' home in Kettering Road North in time for his 7pm curfew. His grandparents gave him £1 and Sean left their home alone sometime between 5.30pm and 6pm. When 7pm came around, Sean hadn't arrived home. Though no details are available about those first few anxious hours of Sean's seeming disappearance, it is known that the McGanns raised the alarm later in the evening. By the following morning, the search for Sean was called off. He'd been found. No attempt had been made to cover or conceal Sean's body. He'd been dumped in the middle of an alleyway in a built-up residential area approximately two miles from the Midsummer Fairground and around a mile from his home. At the scene, it was found that Sean's belt and shoes had been removed and placed near his body. His distinctive glasses and orange and black wet look Campari brand leather jacket were both missing. Neither of these two items has ever been found. A post-mortem examination of Sean's body confirmed his cause of death to be asphyxia. He'd been strangled to death. 
it's suspected that his body had been left in the alleyway on Birchfield Road East around an hour before he was found, sometime after 6.45am. This meant that Sean had likely been murdered elsewhere. Though his body didn't show any signs of sexual assault, police did suspect a sexual motive lay behind the killing. Little else was disclosed from the post-mortem, and it's not clear if that's because there was nothing else to share or if certain details have been intentionally withheld by investigators. Northamptonshire Police immediately launched a major murder investigation. The police investigation into Sean's murder was to be headed up by the force's most senior detective, Detective Chief Superintendent Arthur Crawley. Door-to-door -door inquiries were carried out around the Abington area. Sean's friends and several of his classmates were questioned. Police initially theorised that Sean had been abducted from the fair by a stranger. Beckett Park, a public green space close to the Midsummer Fairground, was searched and the nearby Riverside area was combed for evidence. Nothing was found. On the day that Sean disappeared, local football club Northampton Town played Crew Alexandra at the club's nearby county ground on Wantage Road. It was discovered that there had been violent clashes between football hooligans in the area. From this, a new line of inquiry emerged. Police believed it was possible that Sean had been attacked and killed by a gang of football hooligans. They would hand out leaflets at Northampton Town's next home game and hire a lookalike to walk around the county ground in a jacket identical to the one worn by Sean. Northamptonshire police were eventually able to rule out this theory after speaking with a gang of youths believed to have been involved in football hooliganism. Police would then return their attention to Beckett Park. The park was known to be a gay cruising area. Attitudes to LGBT people in 1979 were vastly different to our current time. Gay men were viewed by many as sexual deviants and potential predators. Beckett Park's proximity to the Easter Fair and its reputation as a gay cruising spot, combined with the suspected sexual motive behind Sean's murder, led police to believe that answers in his case could be found within Northampton's gay community. Around this time, police would begin surveilling Beckett Park and swooping on men that they suspected may be cruising in the area. This aspect of the police investigation caused great upset amongst Northampton's LGBT community. This police line of inquiry would produce nothing. In 2019, Northamptonshire police would admit that their tactics were heavy-handed and prejudiced. Six months after Sean's murder, and with more than 9,000 statements taken, the police had nothing, and were no closer to catching the killer. A reward fund of £1,000 for information in Sean's case was pulled together by a group of local business people. This incentive would attract no new useful information. Sean's case would go cold, and it would remain that way for 40 years. On the 40th anniversary of Sean's murder, in April of 2019, Northamptonshire Police would reopen Sean's case and renew their appeal for information. His story would be featured again in local news, as well as the BBC News, and the BBC would run a segment on Sean's case on their programme Crime Watch Roadshow. For the first time in 40 years, new information will be shared with the public. The first was two images taken at the scene of the crime on the day of the discovery of Sean's body. The images showed two pieces of chalk-drawn graffiti found written on the wall of the alleyway where Sean's body was found. The writing said, quote, very sorry, and quote, no I'm not. It remains unknown if these are the scrawlings of the person responsible for Sean's murder or if they are entirely unrelated to the case. Police would also share for the first time the image of an envelope that had contained a letter addressed to the McGann family business and received in 1991, 12 years after the murder. Though police were not able to be specific about the contents of the letter, they believed that the writer held significant information in the case and even claimed to know the identity of Sean's killer. Detective Chief Inspector Joe Banfield said of the letter in December of 2019, I'm convinced that someone out there knows something and I would ask them to search their consciences for the sake of Sean's family and tell us what they know. The writer of that letter remains anonymous, but they had some really relevant information, we think, about the crime. 
police would reveal that they had received funding to carry out a full-scale review of Sean's case and that DNA had been found on the envelope. Despite later reporting that they had received, quote, helpful calls since their renewed appeal in 2019, Northamptonshire police have said nothing further about Sean's case or the potential DNA testing in the two years since that time. So many fundamental questions remain unanswered in Sean's case. We don't know where he was taken from. Was it while en route from his grandparents' house to the Easter Fair? Was it at the fair itself? Or was it on the way back to his home after leaving the fair? No one has ever come forward to report having seen Sean that evening, and as it was 1979, CCTV cameras were not as widespread as they are today. This means that Sean is completely untraceable between the time that he left his grandparents' house until the time that his body was discovered. We also aren't able to say how Sean was taken by his killer. Was it a violent abduction? Or was Sean lured away, perhaps to a vehicle, or a house, or even a secluded outdoor space? Could multiple people have had a hand in the crime? As mentioned earlier in the video, the details released from Sean's post-mortem are limited. Because of this, it's impossible to know if Sean sustained any defensive injuries, bruises or scratches for example, that might indicate a struggle with his killer. Police believe that Sean was murdered in one location and his body disposed of at another. They also believe that his body was dumped at the location in Birchfield Road East as little as an hour before his discovery, though it wasn't disclosed publicly how long Sean is believed to have been dead at that time. So we can't even say where the murder was carried out or where he and later his body were kept between the time of his abduction and the time of his body's disposal the following morning. We can also only speculate as to why Sean's killer chose the location that he did to dump his body. Was the killer a Northampton local? Or someone passing through? Or perhaps working in the area? And where are Sean's glasses and coat? Why were these items not left with his body? Were they perhaps taken as trophies? Or was the killer forced to destroy them? There were no signs that Sean had been sexually assaulted. However, he was found with his shoes and belt removed. This has led police to the conclusion that the killer's motive was sexual. But was this in fact the killer's motive? Could Sean have agreed to meet someone at the fair? Either someone he knew closely or a secret friend that he hadn't told anyone else about? Or was Sean simply in the wrong place at the wrong time when he crossed paths with a predator? In 2021, Northamptonshire Police for the first time confirmed the name of a man that they had investigated as a possible suspect in Sean's murder. That man's name is Sidney Cook. Labelled as Britain's most notorious paedophile, Sidney Cook was the leader of a child abuse ring dubbed the Dirty Dozen. Cook and his gang operated in London in the 80s, though the group is linked to missing and murdered children cases outside of London and stretching as far back as the 1970s. The so-called Dirty Dozen would hire rent boys and snatch lone children off the street before drugging and raping them. The group's activities were first exposed in 1989 when Cook and three of his accomplices were jailed for the manslaughter of 14-year-old Jason Swift. Jason's naked body was found in rural Essex, 30 miles outside of London, in 1985. He'd been drugged, gang-raped and finally asphyxiated in a property in the London borough of Hackney. For this crime, Cook was sentenced to 19 years in prison, which was reduced to 16 on appeal. He was released early in 1999, amid much public protest. During their time in prison, Cook and his accomplices are alleged to have confessed to an informant to the murders of 15 or more other children. The specific details of these alleged confessions or their validity is not publicly known. When questioned again by police in the 1990s, one of Cook's accomplices, Leslie Bailey, would implicate the abuse ring in two further child murders. The killings of Mark Tildesley in 1984 and Barry Lewis in 1985. Six-year-old Barry was abducted from the streets of Walworth, South London. His body was found two months later, a week after the discovery of the body of Jason Swift and just 10 miles away. 
A post-mortem examination showed that, like Jason, Barry had been drugged, raped and asphyxiated. Seven-year-old Mark Tildesley was abducted from working unfair a year before the murders of Jason Swift and Barry Lewis. Leslie Bailey would claim to police that Mark was lured away from the fair with the promise of sweets by Sidney Cook. Though Mark Tildesley's body was never found, Leslie Bailey's confession that the group had abducted, drugged, gang-raped and killed the child in Sidney Cook's caravan was enough for the Crown Prosecution Service to pursue a conviction. Leslie Bailey was found guilty in the murders of both boys. The Crown Prosecution Service, however, did not pursue the prosecution of Sidney Cook as they deemed that there was not enough evidence to secure a conviction against him. This means that, though police are convinced of Cook's involvement in the killings of all three boys, he has only ever faced trial and conviction for the manslaughter of Jason Swift. Sidney Cook was arrested again just months after his release from prison in 1999, this time for the historic abuse of two young brothers in the 1970s. A judge sentenced him to a minimum of five years in prison, but informed him that he would only be released when the parole board was satisfied that he was no longer a danger to the public. In 2021, 94-year-old Cook was denied parole for the tenth time. He'll die in prison. The detective who led the investigation into the Dirty Dozen has suggested that the disappearance of 15-year-old Martin Allen in 1979 and the murder of 8-year-old Vishal Merotra, both from London, fit the paedophile gang's M.O. So what potentially links Sidney Cook to the murder of Sean McGann? Sidney Cook was a fairground worker who, through his work, travelled the country. Jason Swift, whose exact whereabouts in the weeks before his disappearance aren't known, is believed to have travelled the south of England, working on funfairs. This is what he told his mum in letters and postcards that he'd written to her before his death. Mark Tildesley was abducted from a funfair in Wokingham. Potential Dirty Dozen victim Vishal Merotra was abducted from Putney on the day of the wedding of Prince Charles and Lady Diana Spencer. The country was celebrating the marriage and there were two fun fairs in his local area. Sean McGann disappeared either on his way to, at or on his way home from a fun fair. Jason Swift, Barry Lewis and Mark Tildesley were all killed by asphyxiation. Sean McGann was killed by asphyxiation. The deaths of Swift, Lewis and Tildesley all had a sadistic sexual motive. Police strongly suspect the killer of Sean McGann was driven by a sexual motive. Despite all of these commonalities between the cases, there is no known evidence that Sidney Cook was at the Easter Fair in Northampton on the evening of Sean's murder. And Cook is not known to have any personal links to Northampton, a town 70 miles away from London. However, two of his associates did. Stephen Burrell, who was found to be living under an assumed name in Abington, Northampton in 1998, and Robert Oliver, who was also reported to have lived in a hostel in Northampton after he was released from prison for the manslaughter of Jason Swift. A spokesman for Northamptonshire Police said, Sidney Cook was looked at as a possible suspect. He has always declined to be interviewed by Northamptonshire Police. However, from records in our possession, neither he nor any of his known associates were working at the funfair. Many other boys were murdered or went missing in London and other parts of the UK in the years that the Dirty Dozen were active, though the full story of Sidney Cook and his gang of predators is a topic for another video. There are no other publicly known suspects or persons of interest in Sean's murder, and his case remains cold. Sean McGann's family released a statement via the police in 2019. They said, Sean was a much loved son, brother, grandson and nephew and is greatly missed. He was a gentle, loving boy, only just past his 15th birthday. He enjoyed spending time with his family and loved horses and horse riding. 40 years on, we still think of him every day. Anyone with information in Sean's case is asked to contact the police on 101 or call Crime Stoppers anonymously on 0800 555 111.